All right, good evening, everyone. Can I be heard? All right. Okay, good. I think I can angle myself around and get rid of that light behind me. It looks like I'm not, uh, not blinding light behind me. It looks like we've got 16 people joining us. All right, and everyone's got their wine. All right, what's everybody drinking tonight? I'm drinking this, uh, I figure it's the Easter octave so we can drink a somewhat scandalous and maybe joyful wine. The seven deadly Zins, as in Zinfandel. Not the seven deadly sins, as in pride, avarice, lust, anger, you know, all those uh, all those seven deadly sins. All right. Okay, Liz, good. You got a Pinot Noir. Oh, drink it. Someone's... Someone there with the uh, water into wine joke. Uh, I cannot do that. I missed that day in seminary. Oh, Moscato and a Corona. That's a good combination. Watermelon, a watermelon bubbly water. We'll take it. Okay, Pat and Linda have an A to Z Capino. Chardonnay, that's good. Oh, so I'm not in Savage. I, uh, I took advantage of the the fact that my day off is tomorrow and that I could do this, that this by definition can be done remotely. And I escaped up to um, Northern Wisconsin. I'm not sure if Father Michael is here or not. Buttercream Chardonnay.
All right. Well, we'll we'll let other people come on in as as uh, who knows. We got twenty nine right now, and hopefully that'll tick upwards as we go on here. But the we wanted to talk about tonight is um, it's just uh, rising from suffering, rising from from uh, from darkness, from discouragement. Into that idea of uh, resurrection, since it is still the Easter octave, and I thought I would just share one of our one of the gospels that we hear during this time, uh, one of the resurrection appearances of Jesus from from Luke, one of the one of the most beloved, and um, just offer a little reflection, and then just invite uh, questions and discussion. I'll try my best to offer some wisdom. Um, we certainly have the wine. Let's pray that that the wisdom would come too. Um, can't promise that, but I'll do my best. And part of that is knowing when to say that's a look it up question, but hopefully the the Lord will offer uh, offer wisdom uh, through through um, those who gather here tonight. So let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter twenty four. That very day, two of them were going. To a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still and looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor? To Jerusalem, who does not know the things that have happened there in these days. And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all that the scriptures, all the scripture interpreted to them in the scriptures, all of the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and now the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? They rose that, at that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread, the gospel of the Lord. Lord, we ask you as we gather tonight to give us a sense of your presence with us, even through this remote gathering where we know that we are present, not in the way we would wish, but uh, even still that we are present, that we are all about the same activity together in community asking you to be with us, sharing the good things of the earth together, even a simple gift of good wine and good friendship, Christian friendship. We ask that your wisdom would be sent upon us through the Holy Spirit to prompt good questions, to enable good answers to be given. We're drawn together in deeper fellowship in you. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So I offer that reflection on the on the Emmaus passage in the Emmaus gospel for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, because 
it shows that the Lord wants to gather with us uh, through the sharing of through the sharing of the good things, even simple good things like the gift of of wine. That uh, he did take uh, pleasure in that in the good things of this earth, the good things of his creation that he's given to us. That he gathers in the evening with these uh, disciples. That he walked with them and gathered with them for an evening fellowship. And so this evening we come together towards the end of this week, another week uh, where it's been heavy for us uh, given our current circumstances. But most of all, I just wanted to offer that reflection because of the two disciples that he walked with who looked sad. St. Louis, St. Luke, St. Luke tells us that, that, uh, that these two disciples looked sad, that they were downcast is another, I think the translation I just used, the RSV says sad, but uh, the NAB, I believe, looks downcast. And I think, I think, I don't know for sure, this is, this would be a look it up question, that it's the same word um, that is used uh, for the, the rich young man in the gospel when the Lord tells him to go and sell all of his possessions and give them to the poor and follow him that the young man went away sad or downcast because he had many possessions. Another word might be crestfallen. Uh, so um, to the extent that you and I in these days, and I think that's why that we settled on this, this topic of, of uh, suffering and rising uh, where we can feel downcast or sad or crestfallen, if you will, kind of poetic. Uh, how do we rise from that? How do we t maintain a spirit of, of, uh, of joy, uh, how do we let the resurrection still be the resurrection in these days? And uh, this gospel gives us an insight into that. We remember that Jesus walks with us, even though we can't always recognize him, that uh, this, the truth of the resurrection still pervades our lives and is still the truth that we live as Christians, uh, even though it might not seem very easy to do that right now, that we're limited. I was, we I was wearing the mask at the beginning. Um, that we have to mask ourselves, that we have to avoid human contact in, in a lot of ways where we'd normally be finding it, especially as we emerge into this time of year, which is supposed to be one that's joyful. Think of that beautiful hymn. I was reflecting and praying about the, the words of that beautiful hymn of, uh, of Easter, Hail Thee Festival Day. And there's that beautiful line. Uh, I'll see if I can type it in here. Um, Every good gift of the year returns now with its master. Let me just check that and see if I... So that whole idea of this being the time of year where everything comes back to us with its master, with the, with the resurrection of Jesus, every good gift of the year returns, you know, the sunlight, the longer days, the open water for me as a fisherman, looking forward to that. Um, all of these ways in which so many good things we would want to be coming back to us. And now there's this heaviness. Um, but we know that uh, we, the only reason anything comes to us is because God has given it to us. And so it's in that respect, we have to, Remember to to um, to be thankful, to be grateful, to be uh, to still be to still find joy in this time where it's you know a little bit more difficult because of everything that we're going through. But we're going through it through it together, uh, so we can we can know that uh, even though we're as we keep saying we're we're socially distant but spiritually close. And the other the other uh, thing I wanted to to mention uh, that. I was reflecting on, I read a book, um, I think it was shortly before I found out I was coming to St. John's and I, it was an, it was a biography of Mozart, the composer, the greatest composer. I think I might've mentioned this in one of my earliest homilies at, at St. John's, which now seems like quite a long time ago. And it was a, a line that really struck me, uh, the, the biographer, the great uh, historian, uh, Paul Johnson a great historian who dispelled some of the myths around Mozart, that Mozart was this figure that was just tragic and like uh, had been caricatured in the movie Amadeus, if anyone's seen that. 
that Mozart was this, this crazed, frenetic, um, mad genius, uh, which uh, was actually not really historically the case. He certainly was a man who had, who like many um, composers of his time, many musicians of his time had his struggles, but was not this, not this crazed, a tragic figure like he's presented in that movie and in other biographies. And there's this great point where in the, in the book where Johnson, the historian, is, is doing this biography of Mozart, and he says this about the, the Requiem, Mozart's Requiem, his last in, in, uh, work that was, that was actually left uh, incomplete uh, in, at the time of his death, although mu much of it was completed, and it was completed to such an extent that uh, other composers who worked closely with Mozart were able to complete it in a way that honored his the kind of the trajectory that he had set for it. And Johnson says this about the um, about the the Requiem. He said it's the it's the music of death, but it's not the music of despair. And I think that's an important distinction we have. That as Christians we believe that even something like death does not have to be the worst or the saddest thing. That um, that even something like death that's very sad, it's very somber, it's difficult, but it's not the worst thing. Despair would be the worst thing. So Mozart's Requiem Mass, the famous Requiem Mass, it's the music of sadness, it's the music of death, it's the music of, it's somber, but it's not the music of despair. There's still, there's because it's beautiful, because there's, and there's still some hope in it, it's not the worst thing. So just offer those reflections uh, that we can be sad, we can be downtrodden, but Jesus still walks with us. Jesus still teaches us the truth of his resurrection. He still, if we let him, draws near to us and uh, offers us the, the consolation of, of new life, uh, even when uh, things are difficult, even when circumstances are heavy, uh, that we should persevere in faith and hope and reject despair. So with that, um, open it up, up for some questions. Can anyone, I, looks like there may be some delays. I hope that's not the case. Hope we're still live. Hope everyone can still hear. I'll take a pause and um, refresh my palate with uh, the seven deadly zins in Findel. Okay. All right. Looks like there's... Maybe some people are experiencing experiencing delays, some are not. Hopefully most are not. Would anyone like to um, share at this point by way of the, the live chat? Um, you know, just anything that comes to mind, any questions they have, specifically on this topic of, of, of suffering and rising from suffering? Uh, if not, I can open it up for any kind of questions, anything that I'll take a stab at answering. All right, George asks, what's my favorite sacrament and why? You can begin with that. I'd like to answer it this way. I think the there's lots of, like so many things in the faith, you can come at it from different angles. You can look at things in, in different light uh, as you look at a, as you look at a precious gemstone. But um, I would say my favorite sacrament Let's go at it this way. My favorite sacrament would probably be baptism because it's the f it, if you don't receive the sacrament of baptism, uh, then uh, you can't receive any of the other sacraments. The sacraments are for those who are baptized. So in that respect, uh, my favorite sacrament is baptism. But then after that, I suppose it would have to be the Eucharist, uh, which is the source and summit. It's the sacrament of sacraments. It's, it's the blessed sacrament. And uh, just another word on that with 
with with saying that, uh, recognizing that uh, just about everybody who's watching is is uh, going through a fast from the Eucharist right now. Of course, as priests, you know we can have we have the consolation of still being out, able to offer the mass, uh, but just uh, uh, much more privately. Um, but uh, that's the that's maybe one of the heaviest crosses that we all bear. Uh, even as priests, even even though we can still receive the Eucharist, we're we're deprived of being able to offer it to our people, which is the reason we became priests. One of the main reasons we became priests is so we could feed the people of God with the Eucharist. So even even though we ourselves can still receive it, there's still a great there's still a tremendous lack that we experience, still a tremendous deprivation we experience that not being able to offer it to you. Um, my favorite book, my favorite book. My favorite book of the Bible or my favorite book in general? My favorite book in general, I think I would probably have to say Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh for fiction. Uh, that book I was just mentioning, the, the biography of Mozart, that was pretty good. I don't know if that would be close to the top. My favorite spiritual book, my favorite spiritual book would be He Leadeth Me by Walter Chiswick. I'll go and write these in. Uh, Ryan asks, how is the quarantine for the rectory? Did you find a good routine yet? Uh, the, the, we were talking about it uh, recently. The, that when we look back on this, on this episode in our lives and this time in our lives, I suppose we'll all can remember who walked with us through it. Obviously families, that's pretty, pretty easy, but um, I'll always remember that I, I endured this, this, this quarantine, this shelter at home, this social isolation, in, endured it, persevered through it largely with uh, Father Michael Barsness and Father Nathan Liberté, and did it at the at the rectory at St. John's. And we've we've uh, we've supported each other. It's one of the great blessings of priestly fraternity that we have, um, that we that we do have a, a a pretty rich life together. We pray together in the mornings. We have our morning holy hours in the in the beautiful chapel in the rectory. We've been able to um, we've been able to, as as many know, the the kitchen remodeling was completed, and we have a beautiful kitchen. We've been able to still share meals, even even before that, sharing meals, sharing uh, fellowship, um, ending our day in prayer, ending our day uh, often just with some some laid back time. Um, we watched uh, we watched the finale of Lego Masters last night. Um, that 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 show has uh, taken the rectory by storm in recent months. And as someone who hasn't watched a lot of uh, reality TV or TV at all in in the last few years, it was it was a lot of fun to do that. And uh, we um, we had mixed emotions at the winners of of Lego Masters last night. I think. Um, I find Will Arnett as the host of that show kind of annoying, but also kind of charming at the same time. Uh, let's see. Um, how Mercy Sunday, how will it take us through the storm? Um, Sandra asked uh, about Mercy Sunday. Um, I think uh, that'll be a great gift to us. Um, we're off, we're actually just um, final, kind of finalizing the plans for the, for the observance of Divine Mercy Sunday. We'll have a well, that'll be part of the live stream uh, uh, in addition to the mass on Sunday. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity for drive through uh, blessing with the Eucharist after that. Um, Sarah asks, do you have any reflections you'd recommend during these times of suffering? Yeah, I think, uh, well, like it began with uh, just really meditating on the, on the scriptures, most of all uh, the, the resurrection appearances and realizing that um, that one of the common things, one of the common threads that links together so many of the, the resurrection appearances to Jesus after he rose from the dead and, and as he appeared to uh, the, his, the disciples, the women, the, the, like we heard tonight, the, the, uh, the, two, um, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus is so often they didn't recognize him at first. 
And I think that's going to be something we'll learn and something worth reflecting on is through all of the hardships of these times, whether it's in family life, in, in employment, in, in the priestly ministry that, that is impeded, that, that priests, you know, Father Michael and I and Father Nathan, we're just talking about our life in the rectory so often we're kind of reflecting together how hard it is to, to not have, not to be able to offer what we're, what we're supposed to be offering to you, the people of God, and how hard and painful that is, um, not being able to see family, uh, certainly those who, who are, who have been afflicted with, with illness, whether it's this illness that everyone is fearing or any other illness, um, that so often we can't, in, when we're in the moment, and that's that's what those resurrection appearances teach us that um, that uh, that we don't always recognize what God is doing in the moment, uh, but we later recognize uh, that God was working on our hearts, as those disciples said to each other, uh, "What we're not our hearts burning in a, within us," and then we somewhere down the road the Lord will remove a, the veil just a little bit more and see, and we'll be able to see what what he was doing in our lives uh, through the, through this time. So just praying. Yeah. Those would be the rec the reflections I'd recommend praying with discussing, thinking about just returning to the latest, the latest chat, the later chapters of the gospels after the Lord rose from the dead. Who does the cooking at the rectory? Um, we all do a our little bit of cooking. Actually, um, father Michael's quite a good cook. He made some really great fajitas. Last night, uh, he was kind enough to make for me because I, right before dinner, had some some kind of fires to put out uh, over in Farmington. Um, had to spend some time on the phone with uh, with some with some things going on in Farmington. So there's a little rectory uh, scene. Uh, Father Michael made a nice dinner last night, uh, but we all sort of take turns. Um, we also have uh, it's really really beautiful that so many so many families offer us uh, food. Uh, so generously, we never seem to be, we never seem to have to go hungry, but we all do a little bit, bit of cooking on our own. People do bring us food, yes. Uh, in there. Uh, the diploma behind me, no, that belongs to my brother-in-law, Larry. Um, I do have my own diplomas. I'm actually at my, my, my sister and brother-in-law's house right now because they have a strong Wi-Fi signal. Um, but I do have my seminary diploma and my undergrad diploma in my little front room office at the rectory. I can sh maybe, maybe next time I'll show that. Um, anything that you or father Michael need from us uh, that we can do to help uh, the, the, obviously the, the main thing is prayer. Um, but uh, one thing would be um, one thing that it would be very helpful is uh, just to to let it you know whatever whatever circles you're in uh not just to pray for us yourselves which i which i know so many people do but just encourage everybody to pray for us uh, and to be patient with us uh, one thing that'd be really helpful is to just kind of spread the word as much as you can that um that the, that the parish is really working really hard to communicate um but communication we can only do well to a certain point. Not everybody's on YouTube like this. That's one thing that would be really helpful is to just spread the word as much as you can. Let people know that, uh, that we really are limited in the way we can communicate right now and for just everybody to be patient with us. Uh, do you think you might be our new pastor? Uh, I think it's quite possible, but still not certain. Um, I think there is movement on on that, and I think that um, that the Archbishop is actually really working right now to settle not just not just in my case, but in but for many many priests uh, who are wondering where they might uh, where they might move to parishes that parishes that where pastors are retiring where that that will need new priests that just the movement of priests in general around the archdiocese is being actively worked on and actively discerned by the archbishop and the priests and uh, people that he entrusts with helping him make those decisions. One of whom would be uh, a for one of whom a very important uh, one would be a former pastor of St. John's father Tix. Uh, so I know, um, know they're all working on that very hard, but um, I do think there is uh, some, 
some probability that I'll be able to remain at St. John's. It's a, I would be, hopefully that'd be a welcome thing for many people. Uh, it certainly would be for me because I sense that that the Lord is um, has blessed me already in being able to be at St. John's even for a short time. Uh, and if it's his will, I'd be happy to remain. Um, uh, it would be hard to leave the people in Farmington for sure. Um, and, you know, if, if I were to hear that I were to go back to Farmington, you know, it's a place I've come to love very much. So whatever, whatever God's will is in that, in that respect, but hopefully there'll be, there'll be news on that very soon. Um, what is a funny prank? <laughs> what is a funny prank I pulled in college? Um, what's a funny prank I pulled in seminary? There, there was, there's some of that too. Let's see college. Um, okay. One time in college. Um, and this fits in with my with my love of fishing. Um, that one time, uh, uh, some some of my friends uh, and I went fishing at a at a lake nearby. Okay, I went to college in Dallas, Texas, and we caught a bunch of sunnies, caught a bunch of sunfish, and we took a bunch of them and we loaded them in a shopping cart, and we had someone buzz us in at the girls' dorm, and we just simply pushed the shopping cart down the hall, full of sunnies. And, and then just ran away. So hopefully not too, not too destructive. Hopefully none, no, there are, these are mostly adults uh, sharing our wine tonight, hearing that and won't be too scandalized by that. Cheers. That was a pretty good prank. Yeah, the, the word, word spread of of the shopping cart full of sunfish that made its way down the hall of the girls' dorm. Uh, seminary, uh, seminary prank. Um, so here's a, here's the best one. I at least I think the best one I ever pulled off. So we have a, um, we have a, a, a wonderful brother priest, uh, in our, in our archdiocese who is two years ahead of me, uh, in seminary. Father Nate Myers, who's the pastor of St. Francis Xavier in Buffalo, and a good friend, a good priest. Um, Nate, Father Nate, at that time, Nate uh, was a was a, a cinephile, loved some, someone who loved movies and had very collection of DVDs. In fact, um, wall to wall, his room was lined with shelves of DVDs. And so he, he functioned like the Netflix of this. Remember, Netflix used to be a mail order system. Uh, even at that time. And so he functioned like the Netflix of the seminary. He was very generous and letting, letting guys come and borrow his, borrow his movies. And one time, uh, knowing this, I, 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 with the help of another brother seminarian, uh, played a prank on, on Nate and, uh, basically made it known that he was selling all of his DVDs and, uh, posted flyers around the seminary one day to that effect saying that he was he was uh, detaching himself uh, divesting himself of all of his uh, magnificent DVD collection and had guys calling him and and asking for certain movies and so that yeah oh I won't go too much further than that um Lori uh, I'm concerned about those in our in need in our community does St. John's have any uh, outreach to those uh, that need grocery delivery rent yeah so the answer is in absolutely yes we do it, we're, we're sort of limited in what we can actually do at this time in that regard. Um, so, uh, but, but I, but we, we can kind of, we can certainly follow up on that. That's a good question. A lot of people are wondering about that very important thing. We're limited in what our mission can, our mission never changes, but our, what can change in a time like this is our ability to carry it out in the way that we're, we're used to doing it. So um, we can certainly keep that conversation going. Uh, what kind of wine do I drink? Uh, I'm drinking a Zinfandel tonight. I like Cabernet. I like uh, Italian wines, dry dry red. I like Orvieto Classico, uh, the dry white, famous dry white wine from uh, from the from the region of Umbria in Italy. Oh, what lake was I kayaking the other night? Uh, that was um, early April. Got bad again, and I haven't been able to get the kayak out. That was on Murphy Lake at Murphy Hanrahan Park. Um. Laura, uh, Romans eight twenty eight, great passage, uh, one that I could have cited tonight. All things work together for good. What good is to become of this pandemic? Um, yeah, that's a that's 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 kind of one of the big ultimate questions. Um, 
I think one thing that could be a good that emerges, at least I've in my own prayer and reflection, is that um, actually the deprivation from the public celebration of Mass and the Eucharist and the, and the Church's liturgy, I hope will give us a deeper appreciation for it, how we carry it out, how we act as stewards of the of the Church's liturgy. That um, there's a great um, there's a great, great reflection. I think it's been making the rounds. This is made, there's a lot of answers to that question, Laura. But one I would just I would just offer uh, as a as a brief answer here, um, a, a deeper appreciation for an understanding of the of the Holy Eucharist and its place in the life of the Church. Uh, by being by being temporarily deprived of it, the church at large might come to a deeper appreciation of the Eucharist. Great refre- reflection by Father Kyle Kowalsik of um, Pastor and Delano. And I would just add, you could probably find it online. At a great reflection uh, on the on the Holy Eucharist that's really making the rounds that I would highly recommend. Good thing to come out of the pandemic. Matt asks, what are some areas where more volunteering is needed within the parish? I think as always in faith formation. Um, one, one and I and I don't and I'm having been at at St. John's for so short a time so so far. I I wish I had a better answer to that. Um, honestly, I, before I would say very much, I would want to. I would want to go back and, and ask the staff what they think about that uh, because I've only been here a short time and that time has actually been interrupted so much by the by what we're talking about this by this situation of the pandemic I don't have a great answer for that but it's a great question um, which priests or priests have had the biggest impact on me personally uh, one before any before any other priest I could mention would be my my childhood pastor, Father Father Robert Fitzpatrick, Father Fitz, uh, who before he retired uh, just a couple years ago, most recently was pastor in Roseville at St. Rose of Lima and Corpus Christi, but before that had been pastor at my home parish, St. John the Evangelist in Little Canada. Um, trying to think uh, what other past, what other priests, um, certainly uh, priests that I knew in, in college who were very influential, the Cistercians at the Cistercian Abbey of Our Lady of Dallas uh, in Irving, Texas, adjacent to the University of Dallas, where I went. Father Robert McGuire and Father Jim, uh, both uh, professors of mine in college, great priests uh, who I mentioned them tonight because they are recovering from COVID-19. So pray for Father Robert and Father James. They seem to be on their way back to better health. But many, many priests. Uh, another one would be Father Kevin Finnegan, who was a teaching parish seminarian in my days at at, uh, at St. John's as, a, as in, in grade school, and who's now Father Kevin Finnegan, pastor of Our Lady of Grace in Edina. So many priests, almost too many to mention. Uh, Father Michael Barsness, of course, would be a influential priest in my life. Uh, will you keep up the live feed of daily masses after we're back to normal again? Uh, I don't think we have, I don't think we have decided that. I mean, obviously we'll, We'll probably still have the technology to do it. It's something that we're honestly the question has has maybe just been raised in the most let's say just kind of in the most uh, informal way in conversations. We honestly don't know, but we will have the we certainly will have the technology to do it to keep going forward with it. So, uh, if people wish to, if you wish to keep tuning into mass in that way, if they're not able to get to mass easily, or if you know for for any other reason, we'll we'll certainly we'll certainly have the capability to do it, and we'll keep discerning that and asking the Lord what He wants us to do. Um, good to know people would would like for it to continue. Uh, Karen, uh, let's see, make sure I haven't uh, overlooked any questions here. Karen asks uh, a couple weeks ago during the live Sunday mass, you and Father Michael wore a, a one red and one purple vestment. Uh, how come the two different colors? Uh, the answer to that, I think, actually, that might have come up in the in the um, in the live stream we did a few weeks ago. Uh, the 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 short answer is to, is that um, they were both purple, just that one of them was a much rosier shade of purple, and just the way the camera. So um, 
So there actually weren't two, there weren't in fact two different colors. The perception would be that there were two different colors, but, um, but they were both in, they were both purple. Just one looked, uh, looked very red because of the camera effect. Um, Jill, uh, how do you feel about offering a Latin mass at St. John's? Um, obviously that's something that, um, that is, it's certainly possible. We don't have any plans to do that. If I would, I would want it to be something that would be discerned in prayer. I mean, I certainly, I certainly could say mass in Latin and have done it privately on a very small scale. It's not, it's not my inclination. Somehow, you know, people would show up at mass suddenly and it would be in Latin. It would be something that would maybe just, it would be done very small on a very small scale at the beginning with people who desired it and who asked for it and who would be comfortable with it. It's never something I would want to just impose on people suddenly. Um, but the possibility is there. If people would like for me to do that, or Father Michael, I think would be capable of it too. Uh, certainly a possibility, but again, nothing that would just some, something uh, that would be just be dumped on the parish uh, suddenly. Um, so when did I first realize that I want to be a priest? Um, the earliest I can remember having the idea would be fourth grade. And then when I actually made the decision to enter seminary would, would have been right after college. Uh, Sandra asked, why isn't the spiritual communion read at every mass virtually? Okay, so that, that actually we've been getting some emails about that. Uh, that is because um, we have just sort of been sloppy. So we, we apologize for that. We did read it this morning because uh, it wasn't as if uh, we just decided to stop doing it. We just sort of forgot about it. We've been getting a little bit careless, so we'll keep doing that. Yep. Uh, heard that Bishop DeGrood caught a non-COVID bug. Have you heard if he is better? My, as far, yes, I, I believe he is he's doing much better. Uh, I think that's true. He had he had a very serious, but not a COVID, uh, not a coronavirus-induced uh, influenza. I believe he is he's doing quite a bit better lately. What kind of wine is the church wine? Um, reminds me to take a take a little sip. The church wine, I believe it's some kind of rosé. A lot of them are are just kind of a sweet red sort of rosé type wine. Uh, the church wine, the, the the sacramental wine. In most most parishes, use a wine that is specifically uh, produced to be used as sacramental wine, meaning it doesn't have any additives. It doesn't have any kind of. A lot of times, wine will have cheap or wine will have some kind of additives to it, so it's kind of pure. Um, yes, we'll we'll keep doing this the spiritual communion. And actually, we I talked to Sarah Schneider today, who might be able to actually put in a a, a graphic alongside the the video feed. So we'll hope that that that'll happen. Okay, let's see if I've caught up on everything here. I think so. Let's see if I can find Father Kyle's uh, if I can find Father Kyle's wonderful reflection on the Eucharist that I re referenced a while back. Oh, well. Let's see. Uh, oh, thank you, Sarah, for asking that question. How do you feel about the possibility that, possibility that baseball will be played without spectators? This season, um, my my soul is cast down within me, as the psalm says. Uh, that would be such a great sadness. But um, re recognizing, of course, and being a little bit silly, but uh, recognizing, of course, that there are you know real, real grave uh, situations that are that are so hard to to understand and 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 have an appreciation for in people's actual lives. Talking about illness, death, grieving financial hardship, all of that, all of that, you know, yes, that's all very true. And we have an absolute reverence for that. 
but uh, even even things that are just simply delightful and innocent, like baseball and beautiful, uh, without spectators, uh, that is of great sadness. I feel very sad about that. It's one of the things that that comes back to us this time of year that we look forward to so much. A beautiful beautiful game, uh, the beauty of beauty of of true um, and good uh, athletic competition, a very great great very great human good that'll be sad to be deprived of. Not to mention a, 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 that, that even something like baseball, um, it, it actually does have an effect on people's lives. And you can see the economic impact that is hard to even begin to calculate. Do you think the wine in Jesus's time was red or white? Is there any scripture that tells us? Um, there's no scripture that tells us. There's no, there, as, as far as I know, there is no, uh, there's no scripture. I've seen wine that comes from the can from the from the from the region of Cana in Galilee, of course, where Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding feast. And from what I've seen, it's typically red wine from from red grapes. Uh, so that's about as much as I know. I'm I would imagine there's some pretty reliable scripture scholarship on that question that could be looked up, um, maybe from a you know, from a Catholic uh, apologetics outlet. Um, my 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 strong uh, guess, and that and that's the word would be guess, is that it would be, would have been red, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, Matt asks, "What's a really fun or neat church to visit in Minnesota?" Um, certainly, our 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 cathedral and co-cathedral, the the Cathedral of Saint Paul and and the Basilica of Saint Mary, designed by the great. Um, by the great architect Emmanuel Masqueré, um, one uh, one church that I would highly recommend visiting in Minnesota would be uh, the Church of the Holy Cross in Northeast Minneapolis, which was my teaching parish, one of my teaching parishes in seminary. Magnificent, beautiful church on uh, University Avenue, and I believe sixteenth, uh, sixteenth, sixteenth and seventeenth Street in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, I do enjoy the art outdoors, uh, my favorite activity. Uh, yeah, and did a turkey seriously run into the office door at church a while ago? Yes, that's true. That uh, a turkey did um, get into a sparring match with a reflection in the front window of the church office uh, and the parish office entrance there on 125th Street. Um, I do like, I'm relatively new to it. Um, and my, my favorite, my favorite, outdoor activity uh, without a doubt would be um bass fishing bass or walleye fishing yep god created us humans to be in community but he also created the angels who are also in community with him what's the difference why us when he had them i think the that's a great question jill i think um the uh the best answer i can i can give would be to just sort of direct everybody to the, the to the creation account in Genesis, and then, um, and then uh, what we just what we just lived and celebrated in the uh, in the in the Easter in the Easter liturgy, uh, specifically the Easter Vigil. And that's one of the beauties of the Easter Vigil. Actually, we could probably you could go back and watch the 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 live the re recording of the live stream we did on Holy Saturday night and into into the into the uh, the dawn of Easter and the vigil that. God created us humans to be in community and to specifically be in community with him uh, surely out of his goodness. I think the catechism says something to the to that effect in one of the opening uh, paragraphs of the catechism. Uh, God, out of just pure goodness, pure desire to share his life, created man, created the human race. Are we ever going to have adoration again? Kathy asks that beautiful question. Uh, yes, absolutely, we will. Um, We'll have it. Uh, we'll ha we're, certain, we're we're looking at having a, a drive-through benediction. Jesus again uh, 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 exposed in the monstrance uh, on, on this Divine Mercy Sunday, uh, and then um, whenever whenever the word, it, whenever that we receive uh, the clearance um, as you know, wanting to be obedient to the Archbishop and his wishes, uh, whenever that whenever that happens, that at that very instant, I'll be I'll be very happy, even if it's. Not that it would, but even if it came at two o'clock in the morning, I'd rush into the sh into the church and restart uh, perpetual adoration. 
Yeah. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Sandra. Uh, the yeah. The church in Avon, the famous. Uh, uh, is that the, is that the one they call the cathedral in the cornfields? Yeah, Kathy. Limited hours. Again, that's a question. That's a that's a prudential question. Um, yeah, I think we'll we'll tr we'll try to do something like that. Uh, but that's something that uh, that I have to check with the arch the archdiocese about. The office of worship has some very specific guidelines coming coming to us. Yeah, Barbara asks the, how is the church doing with funding since people aren't at Sunday mass and using envelopes? There absolutely is a downturn at St. John's and in so many parishes, pretty universal throughout the church right now um, that um, that there is a downturn in the weekly uh, the weekly collection. The Sunday giving is down, and again, even though it. You know, every day this goes on, it seems longer and longer that we've been doing this. But to be honest, there's actually not a, a, there's not a great ability to forecast just yet. You know, every year, every every week that goes by that we don't have Sunday Mass, we we collect a little bit more data uh, on that point. But um, but yeah, there's definitely a downturn. That's why it's so good to continue to encourage people to embrace the electronic giving and to the extent that they're able recognizing that um, it's not simply a matter, it's not simply a practical matter of just figuring out a better way to have people have their collections come in, recognizing too that people's livelihoods are being affected uh, day, day to day in ways that um, that just becomes clearer every day. So we have to be very patient with everybody. Um, oh, the, yeah, Karen asked, have you been, been to the grotto in Iowa, the Redemption Grotto? I've never been there. In fact, um, there was a um, there was at least at, at one parish, maybe two parishes that I've served at. There were, there were, um, so what one of sort of those day long retreats or day long pilgrimages that went down to the redemption auto in, in grotto in Iowa. And I just simply wasn't able to go. I can't remember on those occasions why I couldn't, but, um, I don't, I think it's, I don't know exactly how far it is down there, Barbara, but I know that it's, it can be done in a day, especially from the Southern Metro. Chris asks, I grew up with a Lutheran dad. How one time, one time he asked, how can missing Sunday mass be compared to stealing or murder, both both mortal sins? I know how I answered, but I'm wondering how you would. I've, well, Chris, if you answered because uh, because it's 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 clearly outlined in the in the in the Ten Commandments, that would be the that would be the answer. It's it's, it's clearly the the divine positive law. Was the Easter collection up to par? Um, that's a that's a check on it question. Um, Matt asks, uh, better trip Holy Land or Rome slash Vatican? That's tough, really tough. I think um, I would my I would say, and this is just person personal preference or or how I was having been blessed to go to both places. I would I would give the slight edge to the Holy Land. Uh, do I enjoy visiting people's homes for meals? Yes, I do. I do. Uh, Kathy remarks that the trip to the grotto is worth it. Great. Uh, Barb and Gray here. Just uh, Chardonnay. Good. Okay. Ah uh, yes, great question. Thank you, Ryan. What has been the most moving international trip you've been on outside of Rome or the Holy Land? That I would have to say would be the 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 time in seminary when I was able to visit the Archdiocese Mission Parish in Venezuela, in Ciudad Guayana, in in Venezuela. As many of you may know, the church, the the archdiocese, I think back in the seventies, entered into a into a, into a mission relationship or a missionary partnership with the parish in in um, in one of the more impoverished areas of Venezuela, and that's that's saying quite a bit, knowing that the whole the whole country over the last several decades has descended further and further into 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 just a terribly sad um, uh, state of poverty. 
but visiting our, our, our archdiocese mission parish in Venezuela, that was deeply moving. We're very grateful that that was, that was something that we were able to do in our years in seminary. I think Father Michael uh, did the same thing. Um, and of course now in the last several years, that trip, that trip is no longer possible. Uh, because it's reached a level of danger that, even though it was somewhat dangerous, even in the time we did it, has, has progressed even 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 further as that as that country has descended into greater and greater destitution. So, um, I think you mentioned Pad Padre Pio being a favorite saint. Any other favorite saints? Yeah, Padre Pio for sure is a is a deeply cherished saint. Um, my confirmation saint is Saint Vincent de Paul. Uh, actually, uh, how great. A question to be asked today. Uh, today is the feast day of Saint Bernadette of Lourdes, April sixteenth. Also the the uh, the birthday of uh, Emeritus Pope Benedict the sixteenth. Um, saint Bernadette is a, a a very very favorite saint of mine. Uh, another one. Uh, well, I'm growing in friendship with with Saint John the Baptist for sure. Uh, saint Joseph, Saint Paul, the patron of our archdiocese and city. Saint John Vianney. The patron saint of parish priests, Saint Catherine of Siena, uh, would be a, a, a deeply loved uh, woman saint. Uh, saint Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, Saint Faustina, looking ahead to getting more and more fond of Saint Faustina in the last several years. Great, right, that that's a that's a conversation that could go on for hours. Um, Sandra, we've been to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, on the Holy Land is where Jesus walked is the best. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. There is there is something un, un unbeatable about uh, about actually uh, walking in the in the Holy Land. Saint Christ, oh Christ the Redeemer in 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 uh, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, amazing. Also, I would love to see that someday. Thank you, Kathy. Saint Bri okay, Saint Bridget. Um, which uh, if you're Saint Bridget of Sweden or Saint Bridget of Ireland, both great, both great. Can't say that I have a particular devotion to either of them, uh, other than just um, other than just a, some knowledge of them and, and appreciation. I, okay, Ireland, good, good. Actually, we had the privilege of of saying mass at the grave of of Saint Patrick a few years ago which is in Northern Ireland. And I believe, let's see, I'm, I can't remember for sure right now uh, if the remains of St. Bridget are also buried in the same place. I think they are. I, th I want to say they are. I'm, I could be, could be mistaken about that. Uh, typical day. Um, typical day would involve uh, getting up. Uh, it's, still, it's still honestly... Barbara and anybody who's interested in the answer to this question, um, still kind of figuring out the typical day, at least when it comes to being at at St. John the Baptist at and, and you know feel I feel kind of strange in this time because I feel like I barely just arrived had the chance to arrive and get settled at St. John's before all of this all the strangeness of this pandemic situation hit. Um, but uh, ba basically, a typical day, holy hour in the morning, mass, breakfast, several cups of coffee, um, seem like meetings. Um, there's, it's hard to say that there's a typical day for a priest because so much can change so quickly. Um, try to fit in some exercise somewhere. Um, depends on what the dinner plans are. If there's evening meetings, certainly the evening meetings, hopefully there's at the, at the end of most days is some time for fraternal time with Father Michael and Father Nathan, um, prayer in the evening in bed. Um, yeah, nothing normal right now. Agreed. Uh, Rock of Cashel, 17 miles from my grandmother's home. Greg, thanks, Greg. Been, I've, been to, I've been to the Rock of Cashel, beautiful place. Looks like we just hit the hour mark. How's everybody doing? Kathy asks if any prayer shawls are being given out right now. 
because we're all spending a lot of time making some. Uh, that I don't know. I hope. I hope there's. I hope we're still finding a way to give them out. If not, we have might have to be created. Now the the difficulty is we're we're restricted. This gets at kind of a different question. Uh, we're not able to visit, uh, for instance, um, any kind of any kind of care facility of any kind. So, uh, any kind of memory care, nursing homes, long term care. We're we're pretty much restricted. In, in carrying out our normal pastoral care. So my guess is that unless prayer shawls are being privately given, being privately made and given by just the people who make them, that nothing is probably not, not from the parish itself at this time, because we're restricted to only visit, only Father Michael and I, for instance, could really visit anyone and only, only if someone is gravely ill and near death to offer the last sacraments, to offer the last rites. The restrictions are so are so uh, are so uh, strict right now. Father Michael is always talking about movies. Does he ever share the remote? Uh, he he, we can usually pry it away from him. Yeah. I'm glad people are enjoying this. We'll 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 certainly do it again. And. Uh, it would have been it would have been unthinkable not to do this not to share uh, not to share some cheer together over a glass of wine since it is the Easter octave this being the uh, the Thursday of the octave of Easter Thursday um, thank you Barbara Father Michael and I are blessed to to be with all of you uh, Thanks, Chris. If you're ta if you're talking about a, a uh, an incorrupt saint, I think that's probably what you're referring to. Um, by miraculous remains, uh, I have, I'm I can't really say I have had that had that experience. I know I know if and maybe maybe what brought it to mind was mentioning Saint Bernadette, who's again whose feast is today. She's kind of one of the gold standard of, of incorrupt saints. Her body is so perfectly, her mortal remains are so perfectly preserved at her convent in France. Um, but I have, I don't believe I've ever actually had the, been able to venerate uh, those kinds of relics of saints. If anyone, I don't know if anyone made it to the cathedral or to one of the parishes, I think it was last spring when, Oh, the remains of the Eucharist. I have no. I have. Um, I don't think I have actually seen any um, any Eucharistic miracles. You know, really, um, you know, sort of face to face or, or real closely been able to venerate them. When I was on, uh, I was on a pilgrimage last fall. Uh, shortly before I heard that I might be coming to, before Bishop De Groot was was asked to become bishop, and the whole thing unfolded, where I ended up at St. John's. Um, I was in Orvieto in, in Italy where the, the miracle, the Eucharistic miracle there, the miracle, the miracle of the, uh, the corporal of Bolsena, where there's a, a Eucharistic miracle. Um, but I, then I've actually been there a, 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 at least twice before there's in, it is kept in the cathedral there, but it's usually kept in a reliquary where you can't actually see it. And that was the case when I was there most recently. Any good Catholic jokes for kids or advice to share with our kids uh gosh i can't i'm not a good joke teller um but uh, just just live the faith live live the faith with joy i think the the fact that our faith is our faith has uh has actually humor is a part of our faith um so just being joyful um and in living the faith uh letting you know even if um even if the faith can seem like a lot of work sometimes, that it, it just to live it with with uh, with good humor is a great example for our children. Um, I think uh, Ryan Ryan has a good friend who I worked with. And I Ryan asked the next question, but on that point of sharing the faith with our kids and, and humor in the faith, uh, Ryan has a a, a fellow um, a fellow uh, youth minister. Um, Minister to, to 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 youth and teens, 
who uh, who worked with me at St. Michael's in Farmington named uh, Britt Levine, and she's now over at our neighbor in Birming in, in Burnsville at Mary Mother. Um, uh, Britt and and Ryan, I think, could uh, could answer that those kinds of questions much better than I could. Um, what was it like working with Bishop DeGroot as a younger priest? It was, um, that's it. Thanks for asking that, Ryan. It, it was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing privilege. It was a beautiful way to be, to be ushered into the priesthood by such a, a, a loving and, and joyful and, and good and holy priest. Um, you know, I, I don't, it, it's actually, uh, it's actually a difficult thing to talk about sometimes because I miss Bishop DeGroot so much. Um, but to sort of reminisce about those, those, those good times, um, Bishop DeGroot, you know, as a, as a new priest, as a priest, as a, you know, we all make, we all must make mistakes as young priests. And when we're first in the parish, uh, but he was so patient with me and really treated me as a, even though he, he, he did su you know, supervise me and mentor me, there was still, there was still an equality that I felt with him that he let me share with him as a priest, both being priests. Um, both being, you know, ordained um, and, and entrusted with preaching the gospel and celebrating the sacraments, uh, so it was a it was a delightful and and holy and um, challenging. You know, Father De, uh, Bishop De Grood, You know, even at that, he had he had expectations, but he was merciful and kind, and just you know was a was the model of what a what a mentor priest should be. Gospel on Sunday is talked about how Peter and the disciple ran to the tomb, but the disciple ran faster and got there first. Why is the detail so important to mention? That's a great question, Karen. Um, my the the kind of the traditional interpretation of that, is, at least as as I've understood it, and you know even in praying with it myself, uh, that that uh, Saint John wanted to include that detail because uh, even though he, John the the beloved disciple, ran faster, probably younger man got there before Peter, uh, but allowed Peter to go in into the tomb first. I think that's a, that's a, that's always been interpreted as showing that, that Peter, even at that moment already sort of enjoyed, um, the primacy among the disciples that, uh, the disciple that ran faster and got there first, still let Peter look into the tomb and, and enter into the tomb and look into, look inside the empty tomb first in deference to to Peter's authority, you know, you realize, you know, that elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus had already made it pretty clear that that Peter was was first among among the twelve, and so even at that moment, uh, showing that and just that little that little detail shows us that even there, uh, the disciples understood that Peter had a special role among their number. All right. Well, we could probably go all night, but um, but I think if if you'd be so kind, I'll uh, I'll wrap it up there, um, and I'll connect back with with Liz and uh, all those uh, all of us who are are continuing and Sarah Schneider and all of us who are continuing to to figure out how to bring good content to the parish uh, by way of technology. And we'll we'll certainly do this again. Um, maybe not precisely. I think we probably had one in the original sort of vision of of this wine and wisdom. There, there would been a, there would have been one more. I can answer that real quickly, Matt. Um, do I teach a class at the school? Not yet. Um, in fact, I barely ba really barely had the chance to even visit the school um, in such a short time. I visited several of the faith formation classrooms before we had to sadly end end the um or or at least take hit pa hit the pause button because of the the pandemic but um certainly i would love to um love to be in the school as much as possible all right everybody is you're so welcome and thank you for thank you for joining it's just uh it's just great to know everybody's out there and still hungering for for community and for the the the, the good things that god has God has revealed to us of himself and the, the, the gift of faith that we all share. So, And thanks for everyone being patient with me wearing my, my, uh, my day off flannel.
uh, since I'm up north. <laughs> All right. Well, let's um let's just uh end with um by praising the Trinity together. I'll pray the the beginning of the glory be, and and you feel free to feel free to answer and join uh, join your voice to that to that praise. All right. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Was in the beginning is now never shall be. Amen. All right. Well, cheers, everyone. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thanks for sharing the the fruit of the vine tonight. And uh, everybody, be safe and be healthy. And um, keep observing the social distance until we can draw to draw close together again. All right. All right. Thanks, Cindy, for the for the uh, the little note of humor there to close us. All right. Peace and blessings to everyone. Bye for now.